from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Welcome once again, Eric Atkinson here. And ahead today, K-State's Jason Griffin will talk about the research initiatives that K-State will be undertaking on producing industrial hemp in Kansas. He'll look at the opportunities and the challenges associated with this alternative crop as he draws from a couple of new K-State fact sheets on the topic. This week's Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State will feature Bob Larson, Brad White, and Dustin Pendle as they'll take on an assortment of subjects, including managing cow costs and that new study on beef production sustainability. And K-State's Charlie Lee will be by to talk about planning fish management for new or renovated farm ponds. All this and more right here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Agriculture Today continues now. Well, the questions have been welling up fairly consistently for the last few months or so about the prospect of raising industrial hemp in Kansas. And our guest is going to be involved in responding to some of those questions through research findings. Jason Griffin. Jason is a horticulturist by trade and the director of the John C. Pear Horticulture Center near Wichita. And that will be the epicenter, if you will, of this research as we move forward here, which we'll talk about, Jason. But first, we want to acknowledge new life, if you will, for the John C. Pear Center there in Hayesville, to be exact. Uh, There was concern about its closure, but now it is going to be open for business from here forward, it sounds. Yes, that's right. And thanks for having me, Eric. Um, Yeah, we got some bad news last year about closing the the Pear Center due to budget cuts. And uh, fortunately, our, our... 47 years of building a loyal following, our, our industry spoke up and sent letters and phone calls and emails to university and college administration. And I would dare say our industry spoke up for us and saved us. So we, uh, we're here for, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Now, why, then, is the Pear Center going to be the uh, home, if you will, for industrial hemp research on the part of K-State? Well, in the wonderful world of research, nothing stands still, right? We're always moving and uh, chasing new objects and setting new goals. And when we learned that the state of Kansas was going to begin doing uh, pilot research projects in industrial hemp, we wanted to be involved in that that new industry as it moves across the state. And uh, I'm naturally curious myself, and here's a chance to grow a new crop and uh, and see what it can do for, for the state. Very good. And in fact, you, along with colleagues at K-State, have put together a couple of new fact sheets on industrial hemp in Kansas, and we'll venture into those in just a second. But uh, folks need to understand that industrial hemp is not open for widespread planting. It is only allowed in Kansas as of right now for research purposes, correct? That is correct. Um, There's been a lot of news since the new U.S. Farm Bill uh, there's been some sort of misunderstanding that, oh, hemp is okay to grow now for everybody. It's not. In the state of Kansas, we are still under the law as it was passed for 2019. So we still have to apply to the Kansas Department of Agriculture, uh, get approved, do a background check. Um, you can't just start growing hemp without getting approval and getting a license. And not just official research facilities like yours, but any individual has to go through that process as well. That is correct, and every application has to have a research component. Let's go into the information that you provided in these fact sheets. These were just put out, and you bring up the question right out, what is hemp? And for anybody not sure about that, would you fill us in? Yeah, so hemp is um, it's, it's, a, it's a broad term for uh, the plant cannabis sativa, Obviously, the, the plant has two sides. There is the intoxicating side, which has become rather famous, um, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a plant which produces less than 0.3% THC, which is the intoxicating agent, 
less than 0.3% THC, um, which is practically none. And it is used for uh, fiber, it's used for grain, it's used for the CBD oil that you see popping up all over the state. It's used in cattle feed, it's used for lots of purposes, but it is not used as an intoxicating agent. It can't be. And is it the same plant that can serve all of those aforementioned industrial purposes then? It it is the same plant. Um, It's primarily, uh, there are varieties, like in every agricultural commodity, there there are different varieties. Um, the varieties that are used for fiber, as you can imagine, tend to be tall and unbranched. The, the fibers that are used for producing grain tend to be not as tall and more well-branched, uh, so you get more, more flowers and more seeds. And those that are grown for CBD oil, the resins, tend to be even a little shorter and more, more heavily branched with even more flowers. Is it the kind of crop that one would think of in a fashion similar to a commercial garden crop or a commercial field crop, or both? I think when we see it, we're all lear- we're, we're learning this together. I think a couple of years from now, when we've got more experience and we see it, we're going to see large fields, like you would see a wheat field, of industrial hemp that's used for fiber. You'll see large fields, like you would see corn fields that will, or soybeans that will be harvested with a combine for grain. And I think when we see when we see the crop that is grown for oil, I think it's going to be a more intensely cultivated, more of a horticulture crop. Um, think more along the lines of tomatoes, poinsettias, greenhouse crops, um, high tunnels. But, but we'll see. Economists start putting pencil to paper and try to find out what, what, what makes sense. There are a few of the management aspects that are somewhat known, and you addressed those in one of these fact sheets as far as recommended seeding rate. There is something known there, you say? Yes. So there are some states, such as Kentucky, New York, who have been growing industrial hemp. This will be their fifth year. So it's still relatively new, but at least they've, they've got four years head start on us, so we can learn from their mistakes, and we can learn from their successes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, they, they have already developed seeding rates, fertility recommendations. Of course, it may be a little bit different here. Uh, our environment's a lot different than Kentucky and New York, so we're going to have to do some of that research as well, looking at planting densities and seeding rates, uh, time of year for planting. We'll have to do some of that work ourselves. And that information will be forthcoming in the years ahead. There is one particular that does catch one's attention when you talk about industrial hemp. Pest control, well, there are very few options as far as weeds, insects, or disease. That is correct, because the species has been illegal to grow for so long. There are obviously no pesticides labeled, registered for use in cannabis sativa. So there is no pre-emergent herbicide. There are no insecticides. So we're going to we're going to learn here in the next couple of years what some of the big challenges are. Obviously, weed pressure is going to be a big one uh, for these young plantlets as they're trying to grow, trying to compete with weeds. My understanding is corn earworm can be quite a problem. Um, I suspect we may have a little bit of that around the state. So pest management is going to be an issue. So through your research and uh, perhaps other research here in Kansas, learning what cultural practices will prove helpful. That'll be part of the objective here it sounds. That is correct. That is correct. And, and we're hoping, obviously, not now that the U.S. Farm Bill has changed, that some of these companies will begin exploring and getting their products labeled for industrial hemp. Well, even at this stage in the research phase and research only here in Kansas, one of the main challenges is merely obtaining seed for those purposes, it sounds. That is correct. There is a seed shortage. There are very few companies which are selling the seed. Those that are have proprietary rights on many of the varieties. They are not cheap. A 40-pound bag can run you anywhere between $400 and $800. Some of the varieties uh, that are really high CBD resin producing varieties can run as much as a dollar or more per seed. So, yes, finding seed, obtaining seed, uh, and the physically actually paying for seed could be, could be challenging. The fact of the matter is, Jason, that more is unknown than is known about the practicalities and the management approaches to industrial hemp in Kansas. That is correct. And I'm, as I consult people about this, I, I want them to go into it eyes wide open. As with any crop, there is risk for failure. There's only an 80-acre limit 
this year. This is the most that you can plant under one license, and I believe KDA did that intentionally to perhaps protect people from investing too much in the first year and, and losing too much. So, it, like I said, I'm consulting people to go into eyes wide open and, and understand that there is a chance for failure. All of this said, Jason, and we're looking fairly far forward here, but what do you perceive as the opportunity for industrial hemp production in Kansas? Could this be a viable alternative, do you think? I believe that it can be. Uh, like I said, I'm being cautious about it. I'm learning as, right along with everyone else that people who have been doing this longer than I have are pretty clear. They, they think that right now the largest return on revenue is in the CBD oils, but they're quite con- the people I, that I spoke with around the country think long-term that the fiber and grain, there's going to be a, a really nice market for those. And we here in the state of Kansas, we certainly know how to grow row crops for fiber and grain. We should be able to do that pretty well. Uh, lastly, these fact sheets you put together, how might one have a look at those? I have sent them out to all of the agriculture agents looking for uh, resources, and our colleague, Lucas Hegg in agronomy, has a in Kansas industrial hemp website, and he has posted on them on there as well. So look into those resources, and you're going to find parts one and two of the fact sheets on industrial hemp in Kansas. Inquire about that through your local extension channels. You can also go to northwest.ksu.edu and follow the trail to Lucas Haig's materials on this very matter. It ought to be an interesting journey (laughs) in looking into all of this, Jason. The next couple years are going to be either a lot of fun or a lot of frustration, but they're (laughs) going to be interesting either way. Well, keep us posted once more as well. Congratulations on the reinstatement, if you will, of the John C. Pear Horticultural Center. And all the best of luck in this. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Jason Griffin is, in fact, the director of that center, which is located at Hayesville, just outside of Wichita, and once more. It will be the home for K-State's research into industrial hemp as a crop prospect for Kansas in the coming years. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. We're back with Agriculture Today. This is Britton Rucker. Coming to you from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University is another BCI Cattle Chat. Participating in this week's podcast are veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson, along with livestock economist Dustin Pendle. Brad tells us here the topics they'll be focusing on this time around. We're going to talk about variability in cow-calf returns and some of the, some of the drivers and influencers that we have there. And we'll talk about getting close to calving, wrap up with some of the news. As we start to think about cow-calf and speaking of planning and talking about Mm -hmm. some of the things that happened, as we look at last year and we think about what our production looked like, one of the things we often get a question on is what type of returns or what type of expenses income I would expect. And, And Dustin, you've done some summaries in the past, and one of the things that you looked at was... You looked at, in Kansas, differences in cow-calf returns. And we could figure this a couple ways with all costs included, like land cost, labor cost, or we can figure a return over variable costs. And I want to address that a little bit because one of the things that when you summarize the 2012 to 2016 data, so this is a couple years old, but when it came out, the average return for a cow-calf producer return over variable cost was $200 per head. Now, remember, that doesn't have land costs or anything in there. If we put those things in there, it's about $35 a head. But for this, let's do over variable costs. It was about $200 per head. The top third of producers, $366 per head. Bottom third, 
$44 per head. So it's back to big. our averages okay. don't define pretty big differences. Everybody. So what's what's driving that? What are some of the things that we can do or we should look at? So I think yeah, just coming back to I think it's a good point is you shouldn't just look at an average. I mean, it's it's really that distribution because there are some folks that are at the high end and there's some that are way down there at that bottom end. Things to think about in terms of variability there's a lot of things that are driving that. Just for example, take feed costs. If you were to look at the top third and the bottom third, of course, I don't know what that report is off the top of my head, but uh, I suspect there's a pretty big difference. And then it's not only the, it's the feed that maybe you purchase or that you raise, but then it's also pasture expenses as well. And I'm guessing the pasture expenses are probably not that different from the top third to the bottom third. Yeah, you're right. So the pasture expenses are not very different. In fact, pasture expenses are a little higher for the top third and feed costs a lot lower compared to the bottom third. And so, so they're spending. Ha- they're making trade offs mm-hmm. between do I keep my cows in the pasture longer? Right. I can reduce my feed expenses. So I might be willing to pay a little more for the pasture, but then you got that pretty big savings on the feed yeah. side. Yeah, well, the savings I- on the feed side makes up a lot of that. And, and, and that's back to planning and understanding the high degree of variability between the top. It's not a tight grouping that everybody's about the same and does things the same way. And actually, yeah, people do things differently. And, and a lot of times, the, to me, when I look at some of those numbers, particularly comparing the, the, the average or the middle, that middle third to the top third, there's no one big, huge uh, home run difference. It's really kind of a little more productivity. So a few more cows pregnant, a few more calves weaned, a little better marketing, a little better cost control. And so it, it's not any one thing that's largely different between the, the the middle third and the top third it's it's doing a number of different things just a little bit better and again that kind of usually comes down to planning and and being in the right place at the right time uh, one of the other things that we wanted to address today is and, and i'll ask you bob as we as we come up on calving we've talked a, a little bit about calving a couple times the last few weeks because people are starting to do it we're starting to yeah. hear people calving and one of my questions is are my cows ready? And, and, and how would I know? Well, I think one of the most important things is cows head into the calving season is make sure they're in adequate body condition. Most people use kind of a, a nine-point scale where one is very thin and nine is very heavy. And, and so where you really want a cow to calve is around a five or a little better. And if she's younger, if she's, this is her first calf, then a lot of times we talk about a body condition score six. So going out there and looking at the cows, making sure. Tell, tell me what a six looks like. All right. So a six has a, if, if you look at them now, and the other problem is this time of year is with the hair coats, it takes a little more effort to see them and it's actually better to put your hands on them, but it has a little bit of fat cover over the ribs, starting to have a little bit of fat cover, you know, it's kind of excess fat over the tail head and down in the brisket versus a five, which tends to have some pretty decent fat cover coming back over the ribs, but you don't see those kind of extra dimples of fat over the, the tail head or down in the brisket. So slight differences there. As But those cows are in pretty good body condition. And, and the reason is, of course, she's going to have a calf, so she needs the energy to uh, go through the birthing process. She's going to immediately start uh, milking. She's going to start lactating for that calf. That's a big energy drain. And so she, she needs a little bit of extra energy she can pull off of her back fat to supplement what she's getting in her feed. So ha- having her ready to go, if she's not ready now, what can I do? Well, you can increase the plane of nutrition, um, and that's an important thing to do, and that basically depends on what forages are available to me, what, what other feeds are available. And also, when are we calving? Because we, you know, you talk about the average isn't always descriptive. We've got people that have started calving the first part of January. Others that aren't going to start calving till April or so. So the timing of when we're going to need that body condition matters as well. Absolutely. So so give them a check at this point. I would encourage just yeah, regardless write it of, down. Yeah, regardless of where they're calving, I need to know where they are and make sure they're not getting thin. Yeah, because I, I, I think that's something, and we've talked about it a fair bit, if you... If I look at them every day, it's hard for me to see subtle changes. So you can even take a picture today and in a month and say, oh, yeah, they look like they're in about the same flesh or they look like they're getting a little thinner. Uh, Tell you a little bit about the nutritional plan. Last thing, I want to talk a little bit about something that's been in the news. And there were several articles that came out on this uh, new study that was done. And it came out in the Journal of Agricultural Systems. And it was a life cycle assessment of the beef cattle life cycle, and they really looked at all aspects. And one of the things that 
has been a discussion point for the beef industry, whether we talk sustainability or environmental impact or several areas, is the large impact of the beef cattle on the environment. There's been a couple books that have talked about that. When you actually look at the numbers and you look at this latest assessment, their numbers that they have estimated are far lower than what has been reported. And, and I want to read you a couple of those and get you guys' reaction to this. One of the things that they talked about is uh, beef cattle are responsible for 3.3% of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S., which was a lot lower than what was estimated previously. Uh, cattle consume just 2.6 pounds of grain per pound of, of carcass weight. They, the corn used to feed beef cattle represents about 9% of the harvested corn in the U.S., contrast with ethanol, which is about 37.5% of the corn harvested in the U.S. And on average, it takes about 308 gallons of water to produce a pound of boneless beef. So one of the estimates previously was it took up to 24,000 gallons of water mm-hmm. to produce a pound of boneless beef. So vast differences in those, in those estimates and the total impact. Thoughts? I know you guys have read some of the same stuff. Well, I think one of the things to, to think about when you think about beef production is, I mean, we're, we're talking about Mother Nature. We're talking about a, a cycle. You know, you talk about water cycles, carbon cycles, those kinds of things. But but cattle are an important part of nature. I mean, or ruminants are. It doesn't have to be cattle, but they're pretty efficient. Uh, you know, so they... What do you, what do you say? Because of the conversion? What are, what are you... Yeah, they're basically... Uh, the most abundant energy source on planet Earth is cellulose, which is plant material. And humans and other uh, animals like us, monogastrics like pigs and chickens and humans, don't consume and get a lot of energy from that cellulose. And so the fact that, that beef cattle, other ruminants, um, can consume what is really not digestible by anybody else and convert that into foodstuffs is, is really kind of the niche that, that ruminants fit into, that cattle fit into. So it's not surprising to me that, that actually, in the scheme of things, they fit into Mother Nature pretty well. So the last thing I want to wrap up with is our, our BCI beef tip. And our beef tip this week, so we talked about getting the cows ready for calving, but our beef tip this week is related to dystocia or calving difficulty. Bob? So the... the Beef tip for a difficult calving is use lots of lubricant or lube. I, I was actually talking to a producer the other day that says, man, when uh, our vet came out, they used about three times as much lube as we ever do. And I said, yeah, that's one of the secrets that veterinarians learn is is uh, lube is relatively inexpensive, and it really makes those difficult calvings go better. The one concern is because particularly right here in Manhattan uh, over the next few days, it's going to be cold. Lube does freeze. And so, if you if you want to have plenty of lube available for a difficult calving, uh, keep don't it keep a, it in the barn. No, keep it in a warm place and have plenty. Um, however much you think you'll need, eh, double the order. Excellent, good beef tip for this week. If you have a beef tip that, that you'd like for us to share, or you have a question or comment on the podcast, email us at bci at ksu edu, and we'll talk again next week. From the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University, that was Brad White. Bob Larson, and Dustin Pendle. Be sure to hear the entire podcast at beefcattleinstitute.org. Again, that is beefcattleinstitute.org. I'm Britton Rucker for Agriculture Today. Eric will return with today's agricultural news headlines and more here on the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. We're back now on Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here. On we go now to today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, under new legislation offered by a bipartisan group of House and Senate lawmakers, Congress would have checks on the president's authority to impose Section 232 national security tariffs. The Bicameral Congressional Trade Authority Act of 2019, as it's called, would require the president to submit any proposal to impose Section 232 duties to Congress for approval. More than 20 business and agricultural groups signed a letter in support of this legislation, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, National Taxpayers Union, National Retail Federation, and Farmers for Free Trade. The proposal targets Section 232 authority used by President Trump to impose tariffs on steel and aluminum imports on national security grounds. Under the new legislation, Congress would be given 60 days to review any Section 232 tariff actions proposed by the President. Such proposals could receive expedited consideration by both chambers of Congress using a joint resolution of approval. The new requirements would not only apply to future Section 232 tariffs, but those also imposed during the past four years. Besides additional congressional oversight, this bill would also require any national security justifications for Section 232 tariffs to be determined by a Department of Defense review rather than by the Department of Commerce, as is currently the case. The USDA Secretary will be joined at the upcoming USDA Outlook Forum by not only U.S. trade officials, but trade officials from two major trading partners. More on that from the USDA's Rod Bain. This recent announcement by Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue. The Secretary has invited Secretary Villalobos from Mexico and Minister McCauley from Canada to join him on stage the morning of the plenary. Is what USDA World Agricultural Outlook Board Chair Seth Meyer says is among the examples of sessions and events during the upcoming USDA Ag Outlook Forum that he believes... Quite honestly, I'm a little concerned we'll have enough space in the room for everybody who wants to see him. That includes a Thursday afternoon session on trade with Undersecretary for Trade and Agricultural Affairs Ted McKinney and U.S. Trade Representative's Office Chief Ag Negotiator Greg Dowd. And on Friday morning... We'll have the Deputy Secretary and a group of Undersecretaries talk about trade mitigation. And still a lot of emphasis on trade. More details about the February 21st and 22nd USDA Ag Outlook Forum in Arlington, Virginia are available online at www.usda.gov OCE forum. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And despite the fifth year of lower commodity prices and projections for negative profit margins heading into this year, farmland prices in the Upper Plains region remain stable. According to Farm Credit Services of America, based in Omaha, it reported its benchmark farm values of 0.7% up compared to a year ago. In Nebraska, farmland values barely changed from the 0.9% drop from a year ago. South Dakota's farmland values down 2% compared to to last January, while Wyoming saw an increase of 3.6% from a year ago. For you dairy producers now, this week's edition of Milk Lines. Standing by, K-State Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to speak with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning some of the changes we're seeing and the number of farms that are involved in pooling milk on the central order. All of our farms in Kansas are part of the central milk marketing order, although not all farms will actually pool milk on that order due to some different marketing arrangements that they might have. However, the majority of our farms do participate in the central order pool. So as we look at central order pool, the number of farms in that pool actually peaked in 2001 with about 11,683 farms involved today. We have about 21% of that number, about 2,441 farms actually still pool milk on the central order. These numbers are taken from October of 2018, so it could vary a little bit month to month, but in general, the states involved in the central order, about 2,400 farms will pool their milk on that order each month. So how does that affect you as a producer? Well, one of the things that has really changed as I look through the numbers that were published recently by the Milk Marketing Service, so there's been a dramatic change in the size of the farms, particularly here in Kansas, compared to other states surrounding us. Here in Kansas, about 24 farms actually account for 86% of the milk that was pooled on the order in 2018. As you look over to 
Missouri, for example, just to the east of us, two farms over there accounted for only 35% of the milk. You look north to Nebraska, there's 13 farms that accounted for 70% of the milk. And you look to the west, to Colorado, 60 farms accounted for 91% of the total milk production. Go to the south, only three farms in Oklahoma accounted for 79% of their total production. So as we look at what's going on in the state of Kansas, obviously we have a growing dairy industry. But the percentage of milk that's coming from larger farms has increased dramatically, especially over the last 20 years. As we look at the central order in general, in October of 2018, 50% of the milk came from just 3.2% of the farms that were pooled on there. And 10% of the farms marketed about 50% of the total milk in the order. So, as we have fewer number of farms across the state, and we have a few farms that market a higher percentage of the milk, how does that affect our total production in the state? Well, again, we continue to grow just with fewer farms that are involved in milk production. This is not very different from what we're seeing in other places across the United States, but it does impact how our industry might look in the future. One of the things that we're always concerned about is how much milk is coming in from outside the order and actually pooled on our order. As we look at that here in the central order, if we go back to 2000, about 80% of the milk that was pooled on the order was coming from inside the order. And as you look forward to 2013 then, that uh, percentage dropped to about 72%. However, in 2018, at least in October, about 78% of the milk that was pooled on the order was actually coming from inside the order. So what it tells us is the trend currently is that a higher percentage of the milk that's actually pooled here in the central order is actually coming from inside the order, which is a good thing for local producers. It essentially means that we don't have a lot of outside milk that is going to be influencing the total supply on the central order. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension urging our dairy farmers to think about how changes in farm size and number of farms may impact our pooling on the central order. Thanks, Mike, for that update. Agriculture Today continues after you hear this. You're tuned to the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and it's our time set aside each week for a look at wildlife management. Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension, is aboard once more. Charlie, you have some thoughts for folks on planning for farm pond management. You call them fundamentals, and, and this is for those with new or renovated ponds. Some things to think about right now. Sure, there are lots of questions that come up about how to properly manage farm ponds. There's certainly a lot of variables, a lot of things that you may not be able to control, but there are some that you can. And I consider those five consistent fundamentals very important to have a success at your farm pond. Now, farm ponds have lots of different purposes. Some folks want an all-around pond. Others just want the aesthetics some want a trophy fishery, but the five consistent fundamentals are really important for all of those purposes, and they really start with water quality. Water quality is crucial. It's got to be healthy or really nothing else matters. If you don't have good water quality and if your pond does not consistently hold water, you're not going to be able to develop a pond that's going to meet your satisfaction. So how does one manage water quality? Well, it starts with what can you do in the watershed? Is there something you can uh, put in the watershed that's going to intercept those parameters that degrade your water quality? And most often, that's soil. Can you have a grass buffer strip somewhere around the pond upstream so that you intercept some of those soil particles 
or the majority of those soil particles before they enter the pond basin itself. If you don't, then your pond is going to have a short life, and if the water chemistry is not correct, perhaps your pond will remain turbid and not ever develop the quality of fishery that you had hoped for. That is step one, you say, but if you're going to promote fish populations, aquatic life in that pond, those species need to have adequate habitat, right? Yes. If your goal is fisheries, habitat's the most important principle of the management. I've looked at lots of ponds, new ponds, over my career, and we go up to the site and I would see a newly formed basin. Sometimes there would be a few stumps left or a few rock piles, but seldom has the pond been seeded. And I like to have vegetation growing in the bottom of the pond as soon as the pond has been built because that starts the basis of the food chain. And habitat is important, but that habitat can start at the very bottom and work its way up. The structure can be added, and structure or habitat is what fish are going to need to be able to reproduce, to feed, hide, and live in a community of organisms. And the habitat has to be suitable for all of those organisms into that pond ecosystem. And then that puts us back to the food chain. And that's all of the organisms in that pond that are important to make a successful fishery. Here in Kansas, most ponds are going to be stocked with bluegill, fathead minnows. Bluegill are the backbone of the food chain. Fathead minnows typically don't last in a pond very long because they're just simply consumed by predator fish. So think about the proper habitat to support young bluegills, medium-sized bluegills, and old bluegills. So you're going to need habitat for the prey species. You're going to need habitat for the predator fish. And you need the prey species in order to have a proper food web. When we talk about small bluegills, what are they going to feed on? You know, they will feed on very small organisms. Uh, Bluegill have a very tiny mouth, so you're not going to be able to feed bluegill large particles and expect them to be able to consume them. Uh, I've seen some ponds that have been fed or supplemented with feed, and some of those have tremendous bluegills, as well as a tremendous bass fishery, as the bass are the primarily consumers of young bluegill. You say something else, while you're stocking your pond with fish, is to think about the genetics? Well, if you don't have good genetics, it's unlikely that you're going to ever develop a trophy fishery. Genetics are important, particularly on big largemouth bass. There's some bit, lot of work done. The, the Florida genetics are, are important. People that are in the livestock business realize genetics are important and certainly influence the outcome, the size of the product that they're raising. It's similar in fisheries. So that tells me I'd, I'd rather you folks purchase their fish to stock new ponds from a commercial fish producer rather than seining them out from a nearby pond or a neighbor that's uh, moving fish around. I just think uh, there has been some improvement in fish genetics and considering that most of the time you're going to stock a farm pond only one time, you might as well start with good genetics. And if you want big fish, then genetics play an important role. And then thinking on down the line, how one routinely manages that population via harvest. Some thought needs to go into that, you say. Yeah, your goals really dictate your harvest plan, but when it's first stocked, it takes a healthy pond about three years to develop and get to the point where you really need to look at a harvest plan. But most of the time, that harvest plan is going to include taking out some of the bluegill. I usually don't like to take the largest bluegill out of a pond, Same way with the largest largemouth bass. When you're talking about the number of bluegill or the pounds of bluegill that can be taken from a pond on a per acre per year basis, that's usually about 100 pounds. So most people are never going to fish a pond hard enough to take 100 pounds of bluegill out per year. Largemouth bass is quite different. 
largemouth bass need to be taken out of about 25 to 30 pounds per acre per year. Channel catfish are quite different. You need to harvest them and restock as, as needed because they reproduce fairly poorly in ponds. So you have all of these steps to consider, but each one of them, Charlie, is essential to sustaining fish populations in a farm pond. And by thinking about all five of those fundamentals, you can certainly have a much better chance of having a successful farm pond. And this is a great time of the year to plan for that farm pond management. As we approach springtime soon now, Charlie, we appreciate the comments. He's a wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension, Charlie Lee. Thanks for being along with us today, and please join us again tomorrow, won't you? Until then, and for Britton Rucker, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today, over the K-State Radio Network.